Hey, everybody. Welcome to Daniel Davis Deep Dive, our weekly intelligence brief, where we show you the best of what we learned this past week on Daniel Davis Deep Dive, things you don't get on other channels. And uh, in, in case you may have missed any of the episodes, we're going to give you kind of a highlight reel of what we learned this week, turn into one of our more popular uh, weekly shows that we have. Uh, we're also going to look at some breaking news this morning, some of the best things that you need to know to make sense of the world around you. We're going to start off with uh, Colonel Doug McGregor who told us, uh, you know, some things we need to be watching for off the headlines. Of course, everything's mostly focused on the wars in, the, in uh, Russia and in Ukraine and, and, of course, in the Middle East. And we talk about those things a lot because they're things that we need to be talking about to show you the truth underneath what you see, the stilted stuff you see in the mainstream media. But Doug wanted to bring us back in line that we also need to be paying attention to things domestically, especially as it relates to our national security capacity. We also need to go back and look at all of the armed forces because they need to integrate their capabilities much more effectively than they do today. This means a complete reorganization or overhaul of the Department of Defense. This, of course, is the thing that nobody wants in Washington because the existing equipment lines, the existing structures, the 43 four stars and their headquarters and interests, these things support endless defense spending on a scale that is unnecessary and ultimately detracts from our prosperity. You know, Eisenhower said the American people deserve national security. And they also deserve prosperity since it's our job to give them both. And boy, there were lots of people in the Air Force, the Navy, the Army, and the Marines that hated Dwight Eisenhower because he absolutely refused to indulge the bloating of uh, the services and their headquarters. He knew how the system worked. He said, forget it. I'm not going to do it. We haven't had anybody with that kind of uh, understanding and strength in the White House in the last 60, 70 years, and we desperately need someone like that now. We have to put an end to this nonsense, an end to the fantasies. You know, we're not going to sit on Taiwan and prevent the Chinese from seizing it. First of all, China may not be interested in seizing it, and the Taiwanese don't necessarily want to fight the Chinese, and we may see a very peaceful unification in the near future. People don't understand what's really happening on the ground. But think of the stupidity of isolating your forces there. We went through this at Manila in 1942. You know, the whole plan for war in the Pacific involved the use of the entire United States Navy to cross the Pacific with two divisions of U.S. troops and relieve our troops in the Philippines. Everybody, including MacArthur and Nimitz and everyone who took over, knew that was an impossibility. And what happened to us? We put up a tremendous fight, not something like uh, what happened in Singapore with Percival and the Brits. That was a disgrace. He just turned all those poor men over to the Japanese and the rest of it is history. But with us, we fought tenaciously. We still ended up with 12,000 men and women who were nurses marched to, you know. Yeah, the time death him. To uh, these camps where they were treated like animals. Should never have happened. We can't do these things. We cannot put large numbers of forces on islands and penny packets. This is the problem in the Middle East right now. A few thousand here, a few thousand yeah. there. And everybody says, well, it's worked so far and we can go and punish those guys with air power. The real capabilities haven't been employed. People really don't want to go to war with us. But if we provoke and we push and we insist, we'll get what we don't want. And then we will end our role in this world as a great power. We will recede back into the Western Hemisphere and, and we will do it in a state of weakness. Weakness always invites attack and we will have trouble defending ourselves. That happened to the Spanish. It's happened to the British. We're following the same stupid path to disaster. You know, one of the things that kind of theme kind of runs through that uh, episode there, that that segment is also going to be running through really all the, the clips we're going to be showing you today. And that is, what is the plan? What is our strategy and, and various things? And it's unfortunately a thing that keeps popping up over and over, which kind of implies that aside from some generic general overarching kind of we want to, you know, have a lot of money in the defense budget. There doesn't seem to be a lot of coherent thought put behind these. And this is having some real significant, uh, at least building up the possibility of a, a potential consequences for the United States in particular. And, and certainly to many of our allies and friends as well, because uh, if the United States, because of our position of global leadership, if we ever go down, there's going to be a lot of people come down with us. Uh, or alternatively, some could also see these things developing and, and potentially 
detach themselves from us even before something like that happens, which is also not a good thing, especially if it happens because of our incompetence or foolishness decisions. That's one of the issues here that Doug's talking about because of our national security issue. We're trying to basically recreate the, the World War II Army. So we, we made this big change in, in the mid-2000s uh, amidst the Iraq War and the insurgency we fought there and when especially things were really hot in the Afghan War. And so we totally retooled our army to be able to fight counterinsurgencies as though somehow great power conflict was not even on the table then. It was never the truth. It was always, I thought, a big problem, which I, I raised many times in, in the articles that I wrote and analysis that I did even while on active duty. And now that we've gotten through those fights for the most part, and now people are going, oh, dang, look, there's Russia and China. We better get back. So instead of doing something that makes sense and saying, how has war changed since that time, since the World War II, since, since even Desert Storm? I, I think you, you may know, as many of you do, that uh, I fought in a big tank battle in, in Desert Storm with, uh, with Doug McGregor. He was the, uh, basically the ground commander, and, and I was uh, one of the uh, second lieutenant underneath his command at the time. Uh, but the war that we fought then is really different. Even the 2003 war we fought in Iraq is very, very different than the wars now, as is on graphic display between Russia and Ukraine. So you would think <clears throat> that we would say, all right, let's take all the lessons that we've learned from our own experience, things we're projecting forward, and then based on what is actually happening on the ground, and let's come up with a new system. Instead, we seem to want to stick with the tried and true, the stuff that we've been doing before, where, like Doug said, where all the manufacturing is still going on, where all the the, the people that make money from these things and have power, uh, they don't want things to change. So we just kind of tinker around the edges. But what we're doing is, I fear, building up future vulnerability for ourselves because we're not changing to match the current environment. We're not developing the kinds of formations that you need to fight these kinds of wars. And, uh, you know, going back to cores and, div and divisions, which is what the Army is saying right now, uh, doesn't seem to me to be the right answer because that's something from literally the 1940s instead of what's going on right now. Uh, and I think that we may end up paying a price for that one of these days. We'll see. We're going to keep raising these issues as we go forward. And who knows? Maybe one of these days we get some people in office that, that are willing to do the right thing and are willing to do the, the logical thing and actually have a plan to where we're going. That remains to be seen. Uh, now let's jump into the uh, back into the war uh, with between Russia and Ukraine and America's role in it. We had uh, former CIA intelligence officer Larry Johnson who came on to told us um, what is actually America's plan here and <clears throat> why does it seem that uh, Ukraine uh, is taking some actions that don't seem to be really in our uh, interest. Here's what he had to say. So what does victory look like for Ukraine? How do you define victory? You may have heard me say this earlier, Senator, but um, we've said from the very beginning that what we want to see is a Ukraine that's, uh, that's a, a democratic country that, has, uh, that, that, that is uh, independent uh, and, uh, and has the ability to protect its sovereign territory, to defend its sovereign territory, and to, 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 to deter aggression. Does that mean Crimea is part of Ukraine? Crimea is a part of Ukraine. Well, okay, yeah. right. But in order for the war to be over, does Ukraine have to control Crimea? In, in terms of how things transition uh, going forward, uh, you know, I, I would not uh, want to predict what President Zelensky will, will decide. I but, think part uh, of the problem, with all due respect, is that this administration has not articulated what an exit strategy is. To me, this is a blank check for a war that without any clearly defined goals will be endless. What really jumped out at me at the first part was when, what does a Ukraine win look like? He didn't even describe a win. He just yeah. said, well, we want them to be this, this aspirational stuff. And he had a hard time getting that out. Not surprising. I got several buddies that served under him when he was in Afghanistan. If you're going to measure intellectual firepower in terms of caliber, He's a 22 short, okay? <laughs> <laughs> a 22 short? <laughs> yeah. Now, poof, not a lot of pop and zing behind that. Look, the real objective of the United States with this whole Ukraine operation was to create the Ukrainian army as a military proxy. And we worked aggressively at, like, at that over the last, you know, well, the exercises started back in 2008, I believe. 
but a joint military exercises with both UCOM and with NATO. They were conducting two or three a year at least. And these were both field training exercises as well, as well as the desktop exercises. Some of the training that was included by NATO was cyber warfare. Now, you know, NATO always claims to be a defensive organization, but this cyber warfare is not defensive. Excuse me. That's an offensive operation. And the intent was to create Ukraine as a battering ram that would hit Russia. And the intelligence analysts, for whatever reason, genuinely believed that if we put enough combined economic and military pressure on Russia, it would crack. It would force Putin from office. It would cause a split in the military and in the political elite, and that therefore we would get access. This is all about money, but because Russia sits is the number one country in the world in terms of natural resources. It doesn't need to import a single thing in order to run all of its industries. Unlike China, who's an industrial giant, but China has to rely upon the West to produce a commercial airliner, not Russia. Russia produced its first commercial airliner this la in 2023 entirely with its own parts, entirely domestically. And so when you look at the uranium, the gold, the oil, the gas, the aluminum, the nickel, the, Lumber, I mean, yeah, all that. And, and all the rare earth minerals, good God, it's a, it's a treasure mine. And the West has been wanting that. And, you know, you see that theme also pop up enough that there's everything seems to be about cash, about power and money. Uh, not about doing the right thing, not about creating a, a, a sustainable global environment to where we can be safe and economically prosperous, that there just doesn't, we just need the absence of war. That's, that's what ought to be our policies. That's what we should be doing. But as Larry pointed out there, I mean, it's, it's self-evident that that's not the case, that there are many who just, oh, they want power. They want a zero sum situation to where we win, you lose, and we win. And that's the, it's not, it's not either or it's that we win and you lose and that's it. And we want all your stuff. And, uh, it's a fantasy. And, it, and he also pointed out there, I think one of the, the biggest gambles and risks that we took at the beginning of this, we rolled the dice by thinking we can bring Russia to its knees economically by these sanctions. Uh, and we'll provide enough ammunition and weapons that Ukraine will be able to, uh, you know, at least thwart their military and then force them into some kind of negotiated settlement. That was an aspiration. Uh, it wasn't completely without reason to hope that it might possibly happen, but we didn't have a plan B. We said, this is what we want. And so we didn't do much depth of analysis. We didn't have a plan for a contingency plan for what happens next. And when that utterly failed and in fact, completely backfired, now then we're like, oh crap, now what? See, that's the what, one of the things that just drives me crazy as a military man. I was absolutely trained from infancy on up in the military as a second lieutenant, even before I'd gotten uh, you know, out of out of officer school. Yeah, they teach it. You have to have contingency plans. You have to expect that the enemy will take actions that are going to thwart your plan, and that however good your plan is and however resourced and, re and rehearsed that you can expect that they're going to do the unexpected and that you're going to have to react. And so we would say, all right, if they do X instead of Y, then we can either do A or B. And if they do this D over here, then we have to do X or R, for example. You know, we whatever they might do, we would see what are the most likely things they could do. And then we'd see what is the most dangerous course of action. What if they did the worst thing for us? What would that be? And how would we respond to that? That that was a part of every operation. And I mean every operation. You always had to think that through so that it becomes just a, a, a reflexive action in you that anytime you looked at a plan, you came up with that. So you don't just roll the dice and say, well, I hope plan A works because I ain't got a clue what happens after that. That's where we are right now as a nation. And it's scary because plan A didn't work. Plan A, Ukraine did their part initially, they fought heroically and they had much better success than, than anybody to include me. I did not think they would be as effective uh, as they were, especially that first uh, year, the first nine months, especially uh, they had a number of pretty significant victories, uh, tactical and battles uh, that I, I wasn't, I just didn't think they were capable of doing. Unfortunately, the overall arch though, that I had identified from before the time of the war starts still maintains to this day. And that is that the national capacity for nations to support war is still decisively and overwhelmingly in Russia's favor. 
We should have recognized that at the beginning. You could say, I hope this one works, but I have my really plan B and C I've got in my pocket and one of them in my hand ready to throw. So if, if, if this doesn't happen, we, we have something to do quickly. That probably would have meant let's have that negotiated settlement quickly in, in March and April of 2022. That should have been plan B. If plan A didn't work and it didn't, then we should have had that one to go right to. Plan C probably would have been making a negotiated settlement in November of 2022 when Chairman of the then Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, said, hey, knock, 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 this is your shot right here because Russia's weakened from these two losses that they had in Kharkiv and Kherson. And, uh, you know, Ukraine just had their probably the best success they're ever going to have because he knew the same things that I was talking about, how the balance of power is still, even with the losses, Russia's still way above at the top. And he knew where they were going uh, with their economic capacity and then and their industrial uh, capacity. And we didn't, we didn't do it either. We said, nope, we still want plan A. So that's kind of where we continued to go on. And we're paying the price for it now. And as we're going to see at the latter part of this episode here, Russia has now launched a new offensive on top of what they've already been doing in the East. And we'll see how that's going to play out. But let's stick with the same theme here. Uh, next, I want to look at the, um, the ever popular uh, international relations theorist, John Mearsheimer. Uh, is looking at this from a slightly different perspective. And unfortunately, we also see another thread of what's the plan here. So there's some evidence that uh, it seems like we're ha offloading a bunch of our decisions to Ukraine. Instead of coming up with our own, we're letting some of their leaders take the take the lead, or so it appears. John had a different view. I must say, I find it hard to believe that we would fight, a, we meaning the Americans, would fight a great power war over Ukraine. Ukraine is of little strategic significance to the United States. That's one of the truly astonishing aspects of this war. Who controls Ukraine just doesn't matter. And if Ukraine were neutral, even if it was in uh, the Russian orbit, who cares? It just doesn't matter to the security of the United States. Okay, well, that, that raises, raises up another puzzling issue here. All right, so I'm, I'm about to show you something that uh, Zelensky said that he wants to hold this peace summit without Russia, of course, and he wants all these people to come along, and he has any idea that somehow that's going to result in anything? Today I spoke with the leaders of Spain, Belgium, Latvia, Finland, and Cabo Verde. Step by step, we will establish a truly global community. Every continent will be represented at our summit in Switzerland, while Moscow is using the term multipolarity just hypocritically to cover its attempts to control the lives of other nations, we are creating a real tool for real multipolarity. We are inviting the world majority to the peace summit. Here's my problem for the U.S. We can sit there and say that's just ludicrous. It's nonsense. But why do I keep seeing the U.S. say, well, Zelensky and Zelensky alone is going to be the determiner of what they do. You heard Austin say it. Kirby has said it several times. We all want to see this war end, but it's got to end on terms that President Zelensky and the Ukrainian people can accept. We want to help them succeed on the battlefield so that if and when President Zelensky, and only President Zelensky can determine when it's time to sit down with, with President Putin. Zelensky and Zelensky alone will determine these things. Why? Why are we allowing this guy who's making these kind of statements to establish American policy? We're not. It's just, uh, it's just <laughs> the news. I mean, the United States would never delegate an important decision to Zelensky or, or to any other leader for that matter. We're a sovereign state. Not only are we a sovereign state, this is a sovereign state that is run by leaders who believe that we are the indispensable nation, who believe that we stand taller, and who believe that we see further than any other country in the world. And we have no intention of letting anybody else tell us what to do. We're determined to run the world. We don't merely watch global events unfold. We shape them. That's what it means to be the ins indispensable nation. That's what it means to be the world superpower. That's basically what's going on here. We run Zelensky. He doesn't run us. And that's not going to change. And, and the, the only slight dispute I had there was I, I'm not completely convinced that we are running Zelensky uh, instead of the other way around. Uh, though I, I guess you can't argue that he was running us because he's, clearly he's wanted many things and we haven't given it to him. But we have allowed him to continue 
taking actions and and giving instructions to his troops and and taking actions, especially on uh, you know launching these attacks into into Russia proper, which has had some consequences, which we're going to talk about on the next segment. Uh, but you know we still stick with this whole issue of what is the plan? What are we trying to accomplish, especially now? In, in the light of the failed 2023 offensive, in the light of the, the you know, the so far in 2024 where Russia has been making methodical and increasingly large progress in the on the eastern front, in the center port of that, and now that they've opened up a northern uh, part of a, a front, uh, what's our plan? Because do, do we still think that we're going to win? Do we still think that, hey, you know, it's just around the corner, things are going to turn around? I, I I had on an earlier show today, I won't pull it up right now, but uh, you have the National Security Advisor for the United States, you know, talking about, hey, we're going to hold on with this package we just passed to $61 billion for 2024. And then in 2025, we're going to launch a new offensive. And, and I, I just cannot, for the life of me, understand how anybody in a position of authority and power can sit there and say with a straight face to the American people, we gave Ukraine every advantage in the world that they had in 2023 in the months, more than half a year in some cases leading up to that with training, intelligence. Uh, they had fresh troops that they had mobilized and, and had been recruited. We gave them thousands of vehicles, millions of rounds of ammunition, thousands and thousands of rockets, air defense systems, everything you can imagine. Uh, the Russians were still reeling from their losses at the end of 2022, and all of that broke its teeth on the first line of the Russian defense and never penetrated anywhere in any numbers at all. They just barely scratched out a little bit. After that, now that Russia is hundreds of thousands of men bigger now in their armed forces in Ukraine than it was then. They have learned great many lessons from their mistakes earlier on. They've corrected them. Uh, their air force is now much more effective than it was in the first 18 months. How can you say now that with all of the losses the Ukraine side has suffered, that somehow there's going to be a successful offensive in 2025? And again, you have to ask the question, and then what? Towards what end? What is the objective here? Is the objective to just keep fighting forever until Russia is finally knocked out? And, and upon what basis would, is that even a plan A? Is that even a possibility? There's no rational path that anyone can point to that says that's even theoretically possible, much less likely that you want to pin American uh, future on. But that's where we are. That's exactly what's happening right now. We don't even know what we want to accomplish. We, we, don't, we can't even put ends and means together to understand that there's not the capacity in all of the West to achieve that. And yet we stick with it. Whether things are going on behind the scenes, I assume they are. We don't know what they are, but no matter what may be going on behind the scenes, the things that keep going on in front of the scenes and in public and where our money's going and where our actions are, are not sustainable and they're not successful. They're not going to be successful. There's no rational path. Uh, so now I want to shift uh, to a different direction here. Let's go real quick to the Middle East where we learned this week on our show, something you may have seen elsewhere, but we, we went into it in a little bit more depth. And that is a senior State Department official resigned because of her in, intense frustration over many of the things that I literally just said about Ukraine and Russia was also applying to the Middle East about we don't seem to have a plan or we don't seem to know what we're even trying to accomplish. And the things that we are doing are working against our own national interests. Here is Hala uh, Rarit. Uh, former State Department official, uh, who said this. Our messaging posture never has changed. We're still using the talking points directed to the Arab world, even if it's inflaming the tensions, even if it's instigating people across the region, hate us more and be more frustrated with us because they hear the double standard when we condemn an attack on Israeli interests, but we don't condemn the death of Palestinians. So you see this, unfortunately, these themes just keep playing out. I mean, she said it herself there in so many words. What, what are we trying to accomplish here? She was basically saying behind the scenes, and I know I've seen this. I, I personally participated in some of this while I was on active duty, and I have talked to others in the State Department and elsewhere who are in intelligence officials who behind the scenes are some great Americans doing it, working in all these places, who know all the things that I've been telling you, they're aware in their, in their area of expertise, whether it's intelligence, State Department diplomacy, or in the military realm. There's lots of people that actually do understand all the things that we're talking about here. And yet, 
somehow our leaders either can't or won't get it. And, and she went on to say that, you know, she, she tried many times to do the right thing that, you know, to do internal memos and, and uh, other conversations and every, and she was just basically laughed at and just said kind of like, yeah, kind of move to the side there and be quiet. That's, that's the problem that we have is that the people who are running the show aren't listening to the people underneath that do have this good advice. I mean, some of the things that I say here, folks, I was saying behind the scenes in, in our future system, future combat systems program in the past, where we were trying to build a future war, uh, a future a military to fight future wars. And I told them privately, officially in memorandums, this cannot work. Here's the reasons why we're going to have to do something different. And, and I was, I paid a big price for that. I told people about the war in Afghanistan. This is going to fail. We're going to lose. I literally wrote that in public in 2010. I think it was as far back as 2009. I'm sorry. I said, we will lose if we don't make these changes. And of course, no one's going to listen to at that time, a, a young major or, or even later on when I was a lieutenant colonel, because I'm not a, a general. And, and until you get up to that point, nobody listens to anything because they're invested in the system. It's the same thing over and over. The people at the top are thwarting the many people in the organization who do have good ideas, who do know what they're talking about. And they're just taking these absurd actions. And it's just unfortunately because these people replicate themselves at the top. So people like Halal there uh, or, or people like Doug McGregor, I could tell you a long story about how he never even got promoted past Colonel, even though he should have been catapulted up to the four star general level. Uh, but he got sidelined because he didn't play the game. He wanted to do what actually mattered and he was willing to call a spade a spade. So, of course, he got thwarted, even though his combat record and his training record were matchless in the military. But then that's what happens to people like her. That's what happens to people like Matt Ho, who we have on this show a lot in the State Department. He resigns over frustration that no matter what he tells these people above, they don't listen to it. And then, of course, those others who are rising up, they see what you got to do to get along and they will they will replicate themselves and they'll say, oh, yeah, boss, you're totally right you know what? I see a lot of potential in you. We're going to promote you. So the guy who plays the game and, and the gal who plays the game, they're the ones who get sent up through the ranks. And then once they get at the top, they just keep keeping everybody else down. It's just insane. It's just gut wrenching. It's hard to watch, but that's, that's where we are today. And those are some of the things that we've learned in Daniel Davis deep dive this week. And we got one more uh, to share with you today. And that's, that's something that was breaking literally this morning as, as uh, we were getting ready for the show and that is that Russia has now uh, made good on what we had been talking about as threats for a while to open a northern front. And uh, we had uh, President Zelensky come on uh, this morning. And in the clip I'm about to show you, he's going to just kind of announce what was going on and where I'll show you on the map in a minute following that where this was. But what I want you to pay attention to as he comes on here is his demeanor and his body language. Body language is so important. And uh, in other clips that we've shown you many times about Zelensky, even when he's been wrong, he's been enthusiastic. He's been, uh, you know, certain and confident and whatnot. Tell me how you see him in this picture right here. Росія почала нову хвилю контрнаступальних дій на цьому напрямку. Україна зустріла їх там нашими військами, бригадами і артилерією. Важливо, що вони можуть збільшувати і підтягувати ще сили в цьому напрямку. Це факт. Але наші військові, військове командування знали про це і розраховували свої сили для того, щоб зустріти головне ворога. Зараз йде жорстокий бій в цьому напрямку. Артилерійським вогнем, з того, що мені відомо на восьмому ранку. Ми її зустріли вогнем. So you see, there's not a lot of confidence in there uh, in his facial expressions. Even if you didn't even read the words below or knew, knew what he was saying in, in his language, his delivery and his facial expressions alone really were kind of alarming. It's very unusual for him. I mean, even when he's uh, had some bad things happen in the past, he still puts on a very good, uh, brave face. But this time uh, I see a lot more concern in his eyes than I have seen before. Uh, and, and that's probably not for bad reason. Let me, let me show you 
actually the map here of where some of this stuff is happening. Uh, so you can see it for yourself. All right. This is, this is for the, uh, the Institute for the study of war ISW. Uh, they, even though I disagree with a lot of their anal analysis, their maps are spectacular and uh, they track what's happening on the front line. These, all these areas are red are where the front line has been for a long time. And if we zoomed up in, we would be able to see, uh, you know, where all the Russian advances have been in the center part of the zone. I keep missing. That's what's going on right here. But now then, uh, you see up in the northern part here uh, in, in the, the Kharkiv area, the Sumy area, that's where these the troops are coming in. That's where these uh, attacks are now starting along the border right here, if you can see where my cursor is here. Uh, and the, the largest number of Russian troops is around the Kharkiv area right here. And when you add that in, on top of what's been going on, uh, down in the other parts of the zone, which you can see, you know, in these areas here where these green circles are, that's where a lot of the Russians are advancing in the center part of the zone. Uh, you can see that now then Ukraine is starting to feel some concern because they see that there could now be this 600 mile arc right here of the front line could now be added, you know, another two, 300 miles. And it's, it's not clear that Ukraine is going to have enough men for that. Now, what the, uh, what the likely uh, plan for this is, the, the number of troops they have an, up here uh, is about 50,000 to what's being reported by Ukrainian intelligence. That's not enough to take a city the size of Kharkiv, but what's not on this map here, but right up here where my cursor is, right above Kharkiv is Belgorod, uh, a southern Russian city. And that's been coming under lots of uh, enemy artillery fire uh, from their perspective, the enemy. Uh, into the city and, and the, the citizens of Russia have been upset about it. And so Putin said uh, not long ago, which I'm going to show you in a second, that he wanted to stop that. And to do that, he said he's going to have to push people back, the Ukraine side, back from the front here. So probably the most likely course of action for the Russian side here, their objective is to create a buffer zone in this area right here where he's going to push the Ukraine lines back. So they have to push their artillery back even further making it out of range of the Russian cities. And in fact, uh, Gary, if you can go ahead and roll this, this is what Putin said uh, in March of this year about his objectives. We will be forced at some point when we deem it appropriate to create a certain sanitary zone in the current territories under Kyiv's regime's control, to create a security zone that will be quite difficult to cross with the means of destruction that the enemy is using primarily, of course, a foreign manufacturer. So you see, that's what his objective is, is, is to push it back. So he's, you know, getting upset because we keep giving all these weapons. And he says, all right, now then we're going to attack into it. So Zelensky has been attacking into Belgorod and they launched some other operations into the southern part of Russia. It, it had no real military value. It, it had a lot of good PR value because it showed you know a lot of the people in ukraine that hey you know we're suffering well, we're going to make them suffer too and uh while hey they're at war and you, you know you don't need to make it easy on the enemy the problem is when you take actions like this there are consequences and there are reactions and that's what we're seeing here so who knows if if ukraine hadn't been attacking into uh belgorod maybe russia wouldn't have done anything at all but now that because of that the, he's going to take action because he has the manpower and now he's opening up a new front. This this force here has been trained out of contact for many months. They've been training without having to worry about fire, meaning that they're all fresh troops that are coming in here, informed by all the troops uh, and the, the experience that they've gained throughout the two plus years of the war so far. That is then putting additional pressure on Zelensky in the north now, in addition to that whole 600 miles where they're already making progress. And by the way, there's still a grouping of uh, reportedly up to 100,000 additional Russian troops that are still somewhere off the, the map out of contact, meaning that if Ukraine buckles anywhere, if the, if the lines are penetrated in, in a large measure in the east uh, or now in the north, that Russia has... Uh, operational reserves to exploit that and to move further because Ukraine did not do what the, the Russians did in 2020, late 2022 and 2023, build elaborate defensive lines. Ukraine refused to do that. Now they're trying to do it in a hasty way. And so they aren't able to. And so the defensive positions are much, much weaker than anything the Ukrainians faced on the Russian side. So it's, it's a lot uh, more, a uh, lot less difficult for the Russians to to punch through this is why we're seeing that. So the real risk here in the, the remainder of the, of the spring and heading into the early summer 
is that the Ukraine lines could buckle somewhere and Russia might have the ability to rush some troops in there. Of course, then we get into uh, the next problem that we have for the West is then what? You know, we, we haven't had much of the, you know, uh, anything besides plan A so far, but we damn well better start planning on the what might happen here, because if Russia breaks through, there's going to be two real big pressures on NATO. One is going to be, do we finally do what Ambassador Chaz Freeman has suggested on our show? Just have the uh, humility to admit that we were beaten, that it didn't work. And so let's do something that makes sense, something that we can achieve and have a negotiated settlement on the best terms available. That would preserve the remainder of Ukraine. Uh, it would end the war. It would stop the killing and it would preserve all of Western territory. So uh, the risk to the, to the West would go way, way, way down. That's what we should do. That, that, but that also comes with a cost because we have to admit that we were wrong. We have to admit that we were beaten and that's going to make Russia look better. Nobody in the West wants that. Okay. Well, then what's the alternative? The other side is keep with the fiction keep pretending like everything is going to go on or, or, or make all these emergency requests for more uh, weapons and ammunition from uh, other Western countries. But you'll see, it's not a matter of uh, ma uh, machines and money. It's a matter of manpower. Ukraine simply doesn't have it. So the second risk will be that some Western nations think maybe we should give them our manpower then not just our tanks and Bradley's and artillery pieces and, ammunition, but we should send French troops in there, German troops, Italian troops, Lithuanian troops, Polish troops, maybe some might even want American troops. The risk will be great to going, holy cow, we cannot let them win because otherwise all of NATO's power will be seen as being impotent and being defeated by Russia. And, and that terrifies people in the West. So instead of doing what makes sense, the plan B, they might go to plan C, which is double down and do something even more stupid that also does hasn't been thought through and escalate. And of course, as you may know, I think we talked earlier this week, also Russia has announced that they are in the process of conducting tactical nuclear weapon exercises right now as a warning against anybody who thinks they're going to enter the war on the side of Ukraine, that could be in the cards. And that is in Russia's doctrine. So this is actually quite a serious uh, development we have here. And that's why I want to make sure you're aware of all the things that are at stake here. Because if the West continues the way it's gone and making dumb decisions, this could get a lot worse. I pray to God that we finally come to the point to where we say, hey, listen, it's time to, to eat some crow. Have a little bit of humility and do what makes sense to make sure we keep our populations and our alliance safe and in the killing here. That's what we should do. We'll see what happens from here. Well, folks, listen, we appreciate you joining us today. Uh, we love doing these weekend wrap, uh, week wrap-ups, and uh, they turn out to be pretty popular. A lot of you guys like that because you can't always – everybody can't watch every show, but we get to some of the main points so that you stay updated uh, on what's going on here, what's really going on, uh, contrary to what you may see in a lot of the mainstream uh, outlets. And we're going to continue giving that for you. Uh, just to let you know, I'm going to be traveling a lot for about the next 10 days. A uh, little bit in the United States and some uh, overseas as well. But uh, I'll do the best I can to to come and, and have some shows for you there because we don't want to leave you uh, hanging out in the lurch. Uh, there'll probably be fewer than there might have been, but uh, do keep coming back to the channel because we're going to make sure you keep getting content one way or the other, no matter what I have to do. Even if I have to hold up a phone somewhere, I'm going to make sure that you keep getting the information you need because Gary is going to be remaining on the job uh, and he's going to be monitoring all this stuff and doing all the stuff, brilliant things he does back channel anyway. So you can count on our team keeping you informed even while I'm gone. Thanks, and we will see you next week on Daniel Davis Deep Dive.